Hi there, it's me again, Christine, your Auditing Theory Conversation Partner, excitedly welcoming you back to our Auditing and Assurance Lecture Series. I'm thrilled to have you join us for a fourth installment where we will delve into the crucial topics of audit objectives, procedures, evidence, and documentation. So in our previous sessions, we've laid down the foundation for understanding the essence of auditing and the fundamentals of assurance concepts. And then we went into giving an overview about the FS audit process itself with a special highlight, of course, on pre-engagement activities, audit planning, and materiality. After that, in our third installment, we talked in detail about internal controls. Well, today, we're taking a significant step forward as we explore how auditors design and execute the work in order to carry out their objective of expressing an opinion on the financial statements. We will start by unpacking audit objectives, discussing the goals auditors aim to achieve in the context of an FS audit. Next, we'll dive into audit procedures, which of course involve the, the methods and techniques that auditors use to gather the necessary evidence. And speaking of evidence, we will also cover the different types of audit evidence and then wrap it up with a discussion on documentation. Exciting, huh? So I hope you guys are ready because right now we're going to jump into audit objectives. And when we talk about audit objectives, we can't help but recall management assertions. So in the past, we have talked time and again about how management assertions represent or are the representations of management. They are the claims of management. In other words, they are the stories of management. And we pointed out that there are two categories of management assertions. The first category pertaining, of course, to transactions and related disclosures, where in our previous video, we tried to recall this one by saying that, well, if it's transaction and disclosures, we have three Cs. So so C cube and then A P O. The other category, of course, is balances and related disclosures, whereby we only have two C's, so only C squared, and then P A R O. That's for presentation. Then AVA would, of course, start, stand for accuracy, valuation, and allocation. And then we also have rights and obligations. And then finally, of course, existence. Now, if we circle back to our initial discussion on the very concept of assurance engagements, we mentioned that in an assurance engagement, there is always a storyteller. And of course, this storyteller ends up telling stories. And the practitioner would evaluate, would examine, aka would audit the stories that are being told by these storytellers. And so if you think about it, this one right here, the management assertions, these are the stories. And because the practitioner, a.k.a. the auditor, would endeavor to evaluate these stories, the auditor then comes up with what we call audit objectives. So audit objectives represent the goals of the auditor in order to evaluate management assertions. And because there are two categories of assertions, it is to say, there will also be two categories of audit objectives. So one pertaining to transactions and the other one pertaining to balances. If you are able to recall management assertions with the mnemonics or the tips that we have laid out in the previous uh, series, then it would be very easy for you to remember the audit objectives. Just remember that the auditor would like to test, evaluate, examine, audit the management assertions. Therefore, for every management assertion, there will be a corresponding audit objective. So there will be an audit objective for completeness, classification, cutoff, accuracy, presentation, and occurrence. In the case of the uh, of the category for transactions and related disclosures, the assertion on accuracy would have an added objective and that will refer to the objective of posting and summarization. On the other hand, if we talk about balances or the category on balances, we still have the same set of management assertions which we would like to test. And so therefore, we carry forward the management assertions to become our objectives as well. But if you take a look at the assertion of accuracy, valuation, and allocation, we add to that the audit objective of cutoff, which would actually refer to timing, detail tie-in, and this is, uh, this is usually tested when we compare a more detailed schedule with a more aggregated schedule, such as, for example, 
looking at the lead schedule and the totals of the lead schedule versus that of what is reflected in the GL or in the trial balance. And then, of course, we can't ever forget realizable value as in intermediate accounting. We have been talking so much about not just initial recognition, but also subsequent recognition. So you get to see that the auditor simply wants to test the assertions of management and carries them forward as his or her audit objectives with the inclusion, of course, of some additional objectives. Now, to these two categories of audit objectives, the auditor then prepares or creates or comes up with what is called a general audit objective or a specific audit objective. And this is done for both categories. And so, therefore, we will get to read in our texts or in our materials about general transaction-related audit objectives or specific specific transaction-related audit objectives. Similarly, we will get to hear about general balance-related audit objectives and specific balance-related audit objectives. So at its very core, what do we mean by general and specific objectives? Whether you're referring to transactions or balances, the meaning would be the same. When we talk about general objectives, they apply to every class of transaction, account balance, and disclosure, and are stated in broad terms. In other words, when we talk about the general audit objectives, this is something that you can apply from client to client because all of our clients would basically have the same assertions. So regardless of the client, we can use the same general assertions and the, sorry, general audit objectives. And these general audit objectives are stated in broad terms, meaning to say you do not mention a specific account title. No specific account title is named in the general audit objective. When you compare that with the specific audit objectives, specific audit objectives are stated for a specific class of transactions, account balance, and disclosures. And so therefore, when you read an objective that has invoked a particular account title, then that is most definitely a specific audit objective. And I think you could already sense as of right now that when we talk about specific audit objectives, you may have different specific audit objectives for different accounts and different specific audit objectives for different clients. So let's try to draw out even more the difference between general and specific audit objectives by taking a look at some examples. Okay, so word of caution, do not be overwhelmed. Just remember that when you talk about general audit objectives, it does not make mention of any account title. But when you talk about specific audit objectives, there is now a reference to a particular account or transaction. All right. So let's take a look at some examples just so we could embrace these concepts more tightly. <laughs> so let's start with examples of transaction related audit objectives. So we're going to show here a table wherein we will get to see what are management's assertions and what would be the corresponding general objective, okay, transaction related, and what would be the corresponding specific transaction related audit objectives. Like I said, do not be overwhelmed, keep an open mind, <laughs> and just draw out the difference between general versus specific. Let's start, for example, with the management assertion on occurrence. So if the auditor were to prepare a general objective relating to the transaction assertion of occurrence, then the auditor will simply say recorded or disclosed transactions exist. Or you may say recorded or disclosed transactions occurred. Okay. So in this case, without looking at the specific uh, objectives first, try to reflect. When you say recorded or disclosed transactions exist, can you use this particular objective for sales? Can you use it for purchases? Can you use it for, say, for example, utilities? The answer is yes, right? Why? Because it's quite broad. It is not anchored to a specific account title. As compared with a specific sales transaction related audit objective where we say recorded sales are for shipments made to actual customers. Now, this is a perfect example of a specific audit objective which you can only use for sales. You cannot use this objective for purchases, for example. You cannot use it for consumption of utilities, for example. This will only be for sales. Okay, let's take a look at another example. 
let's look at the assertion, management assertion of completeness. If we were to convert that to a general audit objective on the assertion, transaction assertion of completeness, then our general audit objective would sound something like existing transactions are recorded and disclosures are included. Again, no mention of what transaction. Okay, and so therefore, you could readily use this general transaction rated audit objective to just about any client and just about any transaction for that matter. But when we craft the specific transaction-related audit objective, assuming we're still looking at sales, then our specific objective would sound something like existing sales transactions are recorded, all sales disclosures required by PFRS are included in the financial statement. So this one right here is very specific to sales. Okay, And normally, it will be the specific uh, audit objectives, in this case, specific transaction-related audit objectives that we get to find in our audit program at, and which will drive later on our audit procedures. Okay, now let's look at the assertion and accuracy. Now, if you remembered, we added one audit objective and that was the audit objective of posting and summarization because we're still under the transactions category. So accuracy then can be stated in terms of the general audit objective as recorded transactions are stated at the correct amounts, meaning looking into mathematical accuracy and disclosures are appropriately measured and described. Then when we talk about the added audit objective of posting and summarization, which is still intended to test accuracy, then the general audit objective would sound something like recorded transactions are properly included in the ledgers and are correctly summarized, referring this time to the recording of the transactions to, say, for example, the correct schedules or the correct subsidiary ledger. When we talk about the specific transaction-related objective, again, assuming we're still uh, in sales, so the specific uh, audit objective for accuracy would then sound something like recorded sales are for the amounts of goods shipped and are correctly billed and recorded. Sales-related disclosures are accurately measured and described. In terms of posting and summarization, we'd also get to say sales transactions are properly included in the sales subsidiary record and are correctly summarized. Now, one thing I would like to point out to you here, other than you know the main difference between general and specific, is if we look at, for example, the management assertion of accuracy, which we countered with a general audit objective also relating to accuracy, look at the specific transaction-related audit objective for accuracy then you would notice that we are actually having or we actually have two specific sales transaction related audit objective for accuracy. That means it is possible for you to have more than one specific objective to match or to make good your general transaction objective. So it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be one is to one. It doesn't mean that for every general transaction related audit objective you need to only have one specific. No. You can have multiple specific transaction related audit objectives to one general transaction related audit objective. So the ratio is not necessarily one is to one. Okay? So there. Moving forward, because again, there are six assertions and we have seven objectives because we added posting and summarization. So the remaining three assertions would, of course, talk about classification and how transactions are included in the journal as included in the journals are properly classified. The specific audit objective to that would be sales transactions are properly classified. In terms of cutoff or timing, the transactions are recorded on the correct dates. But when we talk about specific, then we mentioned the account. Sales transactions are recorded on the correct dates. In terms of presentation, then we say transactions are appropriately aggregated or disaggregated and described and disclosures are relevant and understandable. But in terms of the specific, then we say sales revenue is properly aggregated and related disclosures in the FS are relevant and understandable. <laughs> I hope you were able to get uh, to see the difference between general and specific. Okay, let's try to reinforce this even more by looking at sample objectives for balance related audit objectives this time so a while back it was transaction related objectives this time let's look at balance related objectives so similar to what we presented we start with the management assertion and for example for the management assertion on existence our general objective would be that amounts included 
actually exist. The specific balance-related audit objective, let's now assume that what we are looking at is inventory. So we will say all recorded inventory exists at the reporting date. I mean, right? So we're now being very specific about a particular account, and that is inventory. Notice again, in our example, in the case of completeness, we have one general objective, which is that existing amounts and related disclosures are included. But we have here two specific audit objectives, one pertaining to that all inventory or all existing inventory has been counted and included in the inventory list, and another one pertaining to that all inventory disclosures required by accounting standards are included in the financial statements. So what did I tell you a while back, right? That you can have multiple specific objectives to one general objective. So there. Okay, let's move forward with the other examples. This time, we have the assertion of AVA. Do you remember AVA? Accuracy, evaluation, and allocation. To the assertion of AVA, we actually have four general balance-related objectives. The first one referring to accuracy, and that is, of course, that amounts included are stated in the correct amounts and disclosures are appropriately measured and described. If we visit the specific objectives to that, we will find at least four here, right? That inventory quantity on the perpetual records agree with the items physically on hand, that prices used to evaluate or rather prices used to value inventory are materially correct, that quantity and price are correctly extended and the totals correctly added, and that inventory disclosures are appropriately measured and described. All of those specific objectives refer to one general objective, which is accuracy. And then we also have the objective of the transactions near the reporting date are recorded in the proper period. This is the general objective of cutoff, or sometimes we call it timing, right? So cutoff or timing, that purchase cutoff at year end is proper and that sales cutoff at year end is proper. Then we also have detail tie-in that is an additional general audit objective, but with, with, which would still answer the management assertion of accuracy, evaluation, and allocation. So this one would say details in the account balance agree with the related subsidiary record, foot to the total in the account balance, and agree with the total in the GL. Actually, if you have been uh, doing audit work, perhaps in your internship, then you would notice that this is one of the very first things we do whenever we audit an account, right? We ask for a detailed schedule, we foot it, and then we compare it with some aggregate or some total. So that is the objective of detail tie-in. An example of a specific objective for that in terms of inventory will be that the total of the inventory items would agree with the general ledger. And then lastly, in terms of accuracy, evaluation, and allocation, one audit objective that we added is that of realizable value, okay? Looking into, for, of course, the subsequent recognition. So that assets are included at the amounts estimated to be realized. Notice that it simply just says assets. It did not actually mention what particular asset. So that's a general objective. Looking at the specific objective, then we would have to say that inventories have been written down where net realizable value is impaired. So again, we take note that in the case of the management assertion of AVA, we have four general audit objectives. The first one, of course, referring to accuracy and then CDR. If you're in the Philippines and, you know, if you're a little bit on the matured side, then you must have heard before of this store that we call CDR King. I don't know if they're still around, but they do sell all, all sorts of stuff. So if naabutan nyo pa si CDR King, if, if you were still able to have transactions with CDR King, that might be a good mnemonic to remember the three additional balance-related objectives. So C, cut off or sometimes you call it timing d for detail tie-in and then r for realizable value okay and we still have other management assertions the remaining three of course we we'll talk about classification and whether amounts included in the client's listings for example are properly classified so an example specific balance related assertion to objective to that would be that inventory items are properly classified as to raw materials work in process and finished goods 
For rights and obligations, we would like to know if all assets are owned by the entity, okay? And the entity must be accountable for all liabilities. So in this case, the specific objective is that the company has title to all inventory items listed and that inventories are not pledged or pledged as collateral. Finally, on the assertion of presentation, the general objective would sound something like amounts are properly aggregated or disaggregated and described, and disclosures are relevant and understandable, and in the case of the specific objective, we would of course say inventory is properly aggregated and costing methods is clearly described in the financial statements. So I hope you were able to see the difference between general and specific. Essentially, we just say if general, we don't make specific mention of an account, but if it's specific, then the auditor has to tailor and customize it to the specific account. And of course, the risks involved in that particular account. Okay, so we have just effectively closed our discussion on audit objectives. Up next, we're going to talk about audit procedures, evidence, and documentation.